to be a quiet bunch this morning, and there seems to be a number of people missing. What's going on here? Ah, there's Randall. Never mind. We've got everybody we need. All right, good. Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, so last week we had a, uh, a well, we had like a, what, a three-week break from our class for the holidays, and then we had one class, and then last week we had off because we did our fasting during this time and instead of our teaching. Now here we are again. Don't worry, a hop, skip, a stumble, and we're going to get there, okay? Um, we are now today going to uh, begin the, 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 the second half, uh, uh, the second phase, if you will, of our, our class. So we spent the first half of our class, if, if a number of people looks like uh, they might be joining us for the first time. Um, the first half of our class was an in-depth examination of what is CRT, right? So trying to understand what are the tenets, what, what, what are the ideas that make up this whole thing called CRT. And so we've spent that time doing that. Um, and now we are moving into uh, the second half of the phase, which is a biblical examination of this idea, where we are going to get much more rigorous uh, in the scriptures, and we're going to look much deeper into uh, uh, the word. We're going to basically take the scriptures, and we're going to lay it over top, and we're going to start looking at what is, what is this, and is it biblical? So uh, if you have your scriptures with you, I would invite you uh, to open up to, I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Double check to make sure that I'm on the right page. I'm sorry, not 1st, 2nd Corinthians. 2nd Corinthians 6. And in 2nd Corinthians chapter 6, Verse 14, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And then a verse that you ought to memorize, chapter 7, verse 1. Since then, we have these promises, dear friends. Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Let's pray. Father, this morning we seek to perfect holiness out of our reverence for you. Teach us to walk faithfully in your ways that we do not join the table of Christ with the table of demons, that we do not join the temple of God with idols, that we walk before you, worthy of you. God, that we have eyes to see the landscape around, the ways in which the enemy works to sow false teachings, immorality, unrighteousness, and wickedness. May we stand firm and be among those who seek to know you and to worship you in spirit and in truth to no longer be conformed to the patterns of this world, but like here today, Lord, seeking 
that our minds may be renewed, even while inwardly we are renewed day by day. We do this, Father, with our eyes fixed firmly on Christ and our hope that today is the day he comes. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, critical race theory. So the way, the way I'm thinking of doing this is, so today we're going to do sort of a flyover of the points, the main points of contention, the main conflicts biblically. Um, and then what I want to do is maybe come back, okay, to each one of these items in the coming weeks and like we did, maybe pick one item and really explode it out and really go in depth. So today is just going to be a flyover of these seven items. And I know you have confidence that I can get through all these items today. <laughs> and then we will come back next week and we will start to go through one, maybe half a one a week. No, I'm kidding. Okay, but we'll, so we're looking at February, end of March by the time we'll finish this class up. But I don't want, here's what I don't want. I don't want it to be so much, it already is drinking from a fire hydrant, isn't it? Okay, and that's kind of why I'm taking it slow. Rather than doing some six week in and out, just this content dump on top of you and then we move on to something else. I'm really wanting to just marinate us in these concepts so that we're, we're very familiar with them. So the seven areas that I personally, in my uh, readings have an issue with, I better stay in camera, Kevin, sorry. Foundations, number one, the foundations of what CRT are, are different than the foundations of the Bible. The foundations of critical race theory are not even the Bible, and therefore they are not what the Bible's foundation is. Okay, so we'll look at that here in a moment. Whoops. The second thing is truth. The idea of truth is categorically different in CRT than truth is in the Bible, okay? Number three, sin, the definition of sin and who is a sinner and what is sin is categorically different than what the Bible describes as sin. You have to understand, well, I'll come back to that. No, I'm not, because I'll forget it. I don't have it written down. What, what false teachers do is, let's say this line right here, is a clear demarcation between false teachings of CRT and biblic true biblical teachings. They will ride the line. They will, have, they will affirm both the Bible and CRT at the same time. Okay? But the problem is, is these two worldviews, they're fundamentally different ways of looking at the world and looking at humanity and the problems of society and God and everything. You can't hold on to both views forever and be consistent. You're, there's going to be tension constantly until one day you're going to shed one or the other. Okay? You can't serve two masters, God said. You can't serve both Jesus Christ and critical race theory. And you heard that first right here. That was actually, I'm going to tweet that later, okay? So you can't. So what, what'll happen is, what'll happen is, is people, they'll try and join them together and then, and then talk both worldviews at the same time in their ministries and in their careers. And you can't because they're just, they're, they're, they're diametrically opposed to each other. So sin is a different sin than what the Bible says. And the only reason they do that, by the way, this is Satan's, this is Satan's ploy, okay? The only reason they do that, why, why they'll go into churches like this and they will affirm, yes, the Trinity, yes, the authority and the inerrancy of the scriptures, okay? The only reason they'll do that is to gain your confidence. It's a confidence scheme, is what it is. I, I, the, the most popular uh, Christian critical race theorists, propagators today are, are people who who would affirm the very same things we affirm, but they add on to it these CRT ideas. Okay. Sin, uh, a different sin. It's a different salvation then. If you have a different sin, you have a different problem and you need a different kind of salvation. Make sense? Okay. If you change what the problem is, it changes what the solution is. Okay. You still have a guy named Jesus who died on the cross, but the question becomes, what did he die for? What was the meaning of that death? What was the purpose of him terminating on the cross? Okay, they redefine it. Identity, fundamental different identity. Okay, the very thing actually that Jesus abolished through his death on the cross and his resurrection, the barriers, the earthly barriers are the very things that CRT seeks to re-erect 
in order to bring division and barrier within the body of Christ and society at large. So identity, a radically different identity um, or emphasis of what is our identity. A great commission, there's a different great commission. In other words, what is the church supposed to be doing? Everybody's got to ask that question and answer it, okay? Everybody needs to have a clear understanding of what the church is in existence for and what its purpose is, okay? CRT has a different great commission for the church. Last year, we did a similar study on this, uh, and we called it recommissioned because social justice recommissions the purpose of the church and what the church ought to be engaged in. And then finally, I like to put this up there because I think it's important, eschatology. In other words, what are the end time views of critical race theory? What is, what's the end game? What, 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 is the, what is the ultimate purpose that that's critical race theory, social justice is aimed at in trying to move all of the church and society to? Okay? It's a different eschatology than what the Bible describes. So let's get into them. So that's a quick overview. Now we're going to do the overview. Okay? Number one, foundations. The Bible versus CRT. God himself is the Bible's foundation. The infinite, eternal, self-existent, holy, personal God is real and he has communicated to his creation. But that's not all. God's self-revelation is contained in the Bible. Is it contained in the other texts of religions around the world? Did God speak through all religions like he spoke through the Bible? Did he speak through Muhammad the way that he spoke through Jesus? Absolutely not. Okay? The Bible speaks, and here, this is really key. The Bible speaks true truth that is true the same way for all men at all times. Biblical truth can be understood by men the way God intended for it to be understood. In other words, the way God understands truth, man can also understand that revealed truth that he's given. You're like, okay, that's, you might be sitting there thinking that's sort of ABCs, right? I mean, it's, no, it's not. It's just this right here. These, these are, if you, if you, if you subvert these ideas right here on this very first slide, you, you, you have, you have paved a huge highway for CRT to have success. Okay. So the foundations of the Bible are God himself and the fact that God has spoken or to use Francis Schaeffer's book title, God is there and he is not silent. In other words, God has spoken and he has spoken in a way that we can understand him and we can all understand what God wants us to understand the way he wants us to understand. That is foundational for scripture, okay? And that's rather than CRT's under foundations, which are postmodernism, critical theory, Marxism, okay? These are all ideologies in the last 150 years that have come about that have sort of meshed together and in these days have given us critical race theory. And there's more, there's black liberation theology, feminism, and so forth. They've all of the critical theories and all of the godless secular ideologies have, have basically come together in a big uh, ideological party and they've produced critical race theory. I had a more graphic word for it, but we'll stick with party, okay? And so you have postmodernism. What is postmodernism? It is the rejection of absolute truth, of objective truth. Not that it doesn't exist, it's just that nobody really sees it. Nobody really has access to it. And that's where you get the idea in the second um, phrase there, knowledge is local. Knowledge is local. That means right here in Spring Lake, we have a way of seeing the world and the way we see the Bible isn't necessarily absolutely true. In other words, God, God has not communicated through his word to us so that we here in Spring Lake can understand the Bible the same way that an underground church in China can understand it. Their context is different. Or the way that, uh, say, like a, a Muslim 
in, in Iran might pick up the Bible and read it. Well, his context is different. So he might come to a different understanding of who Jesus is than us. In all of the different understandings of who Jesus is are valid. Because nobody really knows what is objectively there. It's kind of like that, have you ever heard that illustration of everybody's, everybody's blind and they're all like touching the elephant, but they're touching a piece of the elephant and they're just not sure what they're touching. They're touching something, they know that, but they're not really, it's local. Your knowledge is just local in your context. And here's the key point about postmodernism, all knowledge anyway is merely about power. It's all it is. Knowledge isn't about knowing what is true and, and acquiring what, what true knowledge is, what true truth is. Your knowledge that you have is really only there to serve, to maintain whatever power in society that you have. That's why you hear constantly the conversation is always about power. The conversation is always about who has power, okay? Knowledge is local and only about critical theory. Critical theory, if you were to sum it up, is simply expose, dismantle, and deconstruct all oppressive structures. Is that what we see going on in CRT? <laughs> Absolutely. You don't even have to have a, you don't even have to have gone through this class to see that, that this is what we're talking about, critical theory. Now, critical theory is sort of the umbrella um, uh, discipline under which critical race theory is a part of. There's queer theory, there's colonial theory, there's uh, or post-colonial theory, there's, um, um, there's gender theory, there's other theories all underneath all of, all of critical theory. But critical theory, we studied last year, the Frankfurt School, uh, okay, with, with Marcuse and with a bunch of others, the Frankfurt School where they were a bunch of um, Jews who fled Germany because of uh, Hitler's Nazism. And when they arrived on the shores of New York, uh, they were set up here at Columbia, and they were uh, they were they became these acad uh, these these academics and these scholars who began to write widely about uh, basically deconstructing Western society, achieving the goal of communism without violent revolution, okay, but instead achieving it through um, through criticizing all of the areas in society that ha that show oppression. Okay, there's that tool again, right? Oppression. Oppressor versus the oppressed. And then you have Marxism, which is the struggle of the oppressed for liberation and equity against the oppressors. Okay? You mix all these together, these are all familiar ideas that are wrapped up in critical race theory. These are not biblical ideas. These are not biblical ways of seeing the world, seeing society, seeing human beings. We're gonna see more of that, okay? So the foundations of the Bible are different than the foundations of critical race theory. Let me ask you a question. In order to uphold postmodernism, Marxism, critical theory, do you need the scriptures? Can you be a, can you be an, a, a devoted devotee, postmodernism, critical theory, and Marxism, and, re, and, and, and necessarily have to use the scriptures? I think they have to be absent, Yeah. All three of them actually, not only, not only do you not have to use the scriptures, which shows the secularity of the ideas, I don't even know if that's a word, okay? But it shows how secular the ideas are, but all three of those actually work to shove the Bible out. Any biblical understanding, any true, genuine, authentic understanding of truth in the word of God is a threat to all three of those, okay? They like to use this, but like all false teachers, they use it selectively, okay? Truth. So the Bible versus CRT. Absolute truth exists and is accessible. Absolute truth exists and it is accessible. Is it not? This is the biblical view. What do you have right here? You have truth right here. It's accessible. It's so accessible we have a surplus, a gross surplus of these everywhere in our nation. In our own homes, right? The surplus of absolute truth that's in, available to us is, is, is astounding, especially historically speaking. Okay, so we have absolute truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. God is true. Let every man be a liar. Okay, Jesus Christ is truth. Now, think about this. Jesus... Go to John chapter 1. Go to John chapter 1. You're probably in 2 Corinthians. Swing over to John 1. In 
In John chapter 1, you know, you, you no doubt have heard the very famous, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And that begins the prologue the, of John. But have you read the very last verse of the prologue in verse 18? Look what it says. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only who is at the Father's side. Wait a minute. God the one and only is at the Father's side. Who is this God the one and only? The Son. God the Son. God the one and only is at the Father's side. Now here's the key, the very last phrase. He has made him known. And in the Greek, that's the word to explain forth. Like Jesus' mission was to come, and in the flesh, he was to explain forth clearly who God is. He is the full and complete, if you will, perfect uh, uh, explanation of God. He is the perfect picture. He is the perfect de definition of all that God is. He is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1 says, right? Well, what is his purpose? To make him known. Now, implicit in that is, is, is the idea that God is who he is, and that's how he wants to be known, right? Not like, I am who I am, but Ray, you can think of me however you want. Go ahead, make me up. Maybe, maybe I'm like 330 million different gods, that's what I am. Or, or maybe I'm like the Mormon god, right? And I'm, and I'm just one of billions of gods who has billions of wives and, you know, populated the galaxies around the universe in that way. Or maybe I'm a different god, like the Jehovah's Witness god, or I'm the god of, 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 uh, of Islam, right? You have all these, I am who I am, but you can all just think of me how you want. Is, is that anywhere in the Bible allowed? He rebukes Israel. In the Psalms, I think it's Psalm 55, he says, You thought I was like you, but I will rebuke you to your face. In other words, he's rebuking them for not knowing him. What did it say? Uh, the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Truth of what? Truth of who God is. God has revealed who he is so that he can be known for who he is. That's why he says all throughout the Old Testament, he says to the Israelites, he keeps reminding them of who he is specifically. He says, I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the one who delivered you out of Egypt. And he said it to so many generations. A lot of the generations could have said, well, well, you didn't deliver me. I wasn't in Egypt. That was my grandpa you delivered. Well, you wouldn't be where you are if God didn't deliver your grandpa from Egypt, okay? So the point is, is because you belong to the nation of Israel, your identity is among those who have been delivered from, it, from Egypt and therefore I am your God, and I want you to understand, I'm that God. I'm the God who spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the one who chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the one, okay, who delivered you guys from bondage in Egypt, and you better remember that. Don't think of me like I'm like the pagan gods around you and the nations around you, okay? Postmodernism says Israel's views of God were local. They had a view of God that grew out of their context. But who's to say that the Assyrians' God was any more right or any less or, or any more wrong than the idea of God that the Israelites had? That's postmodernism. Nobody really has a grasp of who God is, which denies the ability of this all-powerful, eternal creator to be able to communicate to us in a way that we can understand. They would love to have you believe that you can't really understand scripture, okay? But you can. Go to uh, Luke, I got a couple here for us. Actually, go to Mark. If you're in John, go backwards to Mark. Mark chapter 12. Some of you are like, oh, I remember this sermon that you preached in Mark. I'm like, you just got serious pastor points for you. you know? You can have a Sunday off now. I mean, like, if you remember that. Okay, so Mark. And this is the, this is the, the, <laughs> the situation where the Sadducees, which were one group of leaders in Israel, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in an actual spirit. They're the materialists of the day. And they came up to Jesus and they said, hey, there was this woman. She was married to seven guys. They were all brothers. 
She started out married to one, he died, she married another, or the one after him, he died, he married, he died, and, you know, <laughs> and my joke during the sermon was, by the time you're the third or fourth brother, you're like, you know what, I don't know if I really want to take this gamble. <laughs> something, be wrong, something seems to be wrong with this chick. <laughs> so they do this game with Jesus where they test him, and they say, okay, she married all seven of them, seven of them. all seven of them died, now, who is she going to be married to at the resurrection? Remember, they don't believe in a resurrection. And they don't believe in an afterlife. They don't believe in anything, right? And then Jesus says, if you're in Mark chapter 12, verse 24, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? What didn't they know? They didn't know the scriptures. Which means you don't know what it says and you don't correctly understand what it says. Look at verse 27. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. You can handle the scriptures in a very bad way, in a mistaken way. You can misunderstand what the scriptures say and not, not understand correctly their, understand, uh, their meaning. Okay? God has a meaning that he is communicating, and it is our responsibility, if you remember our study last summer on how to study the Bible, okay? the whole purpose of Bible study is for us to discover the meaning that God has in the text, not to bring our own meaning and put it onto the text. And the reason this is important is because absolute truth exists and it is accessible, but what they'll tell you is things like, well, it's just white European theology, just a bunch of white Europeans and, and their colonial, their, their, their colonized theology. They came and they colonized the Bible and they want it to mean what they want it to mean because they want power. See the, the, the other point down here? According to CRT, truth is only subjective narratives of the dominant group in order to maintain power. There's no real actual truth that the dominant group is perpetrating on society. There's no actual objective truth that everybody, everybody can see and acknowledge and live by. It's just whatever, whoever has power gets to control what the narrative is, gets to control the ideas about what's right and what's wrong, and that's true because they have power, and so therefore they keep pushing those ideas because it helps maintain their power in society. That's critical race theory. That's postmodernism. All knowledge is merely for the purpose of power. Truth to, truth to power. How long have you been hearing that? For decades, right? Those civil rights, Black Panthers, everybody speak truth to power. Why? What, what does that mean? It means you need to control the dialogues of society or the discourses of society. You need to control the narrative. You need to control the ideas of culture about what is right and what is wrong in order to gain power in culture. It's always a, a, a tooth and claw struggle for power in society. That's what CRT thinks. There's no right or wrong actually in here. So what that, here's the thing. What that means is, is this is not this is not something for us to seek to find truth in and of itself. This becomes a sword that is subservient in our hand to wielding power. And we will make it say whatever we want it to say in order to advance our power in society. If we don't have power, we're going to use it to get power. And that's exactly what you're seeing. That's exactly what you're seeing. Okay, this, this is meant to be an overview. So, truth... Sin, the idea of sin. In the Bible, sin is lawlessness. That is, it's disobedience to and it is rebellion against God and his commands. If you were to sum up sin, which we will in the, uh, starting next week with, as we're in Genesis 3, sin is nonconformity to the character of God. God's commands are expressions of his character. So by disobeying the commands of God, we're actually rebelling against the very character. We're, we're, we're refusing to conform to the character of God. Okay? That's what the Bible says is sin. CRT says inequity and is sin. Social inequity, meaning there are disparities between people groups. More specifically, black people have disparate outcomes compared to white people. Okay? 
That's sin. That's social, systemic, institutional sin. And sin also under CRT is belonging to alleged oppressor groups. So if you belong, if you're white, you belong to the oppressive group of whites. If you're a man, you belong to the oppressive group called man. If you, men, male, right? If you're Christian, you belong to the oppressive group of Christianity. Okay, so you are a sinner by virtue of the group that you belong to. And this is key. We're going to get into this in more detail. Some, a, a lot of times I hear, um, I'll hear um, those black pastors or speakers who, who believe in and advocate for CRT, will, they will talk about themselves as suffering in ways that are equivalent to, way, to the way slaves suffered. Like, like there's, a, there's, a, there's a group identity that extends beyond just today, modern day today. There's a group identity that extends back 400 years, and there's a way of identifying so much so that the suffering they went through is sort of like imputed to them. And so, so black people today are suffering essentially in the same way that, that black people suffered under slavery and under Jim Crow and under the lynching era, okay? And they'll talk about that. And some of the examples in the language and articles that I see is, you know, I was pulled over by a cop and I was only doing like two miles an, over, two miles an hour over, and clearly this was racism because I was the only black person in the neighborhood. See, just like my ancestors, I've been, you know, systemic racism still exists. So there's no distinction. There's just this sort of, this sort of collective, we all suffer. And the other side of the coin is true. The reason, that they, the reason that that sort of attitude is brought out is because the other attitude is brought out. You as a white person may not have personally owned slaves and abused slaves, but you belong to a group that has done that in the past. Therefore, the guilt, the actual guilt of that historical group that you belong to is imputed to you today as an individual, and you are considered just as guilty today as if you did own slaves. That's how you're treated. Just like the suffering of blacks is imputed to today's blacks, the guilt of whites is imputed to today's whites. Okay? It's a different imputation of sin. Salvation, therefore, in the Bible versus CRT. So this is a mouthful. Conviction of your sin, repentance and confession for your own sin against God and belief in Jesus Christ's holy name, that he died on the cross for your sins and was raised from the dead. Sorry, I was, I was writing that and I was like pretending I was in the pulpit and I'm just jamming. I'm like, yeah, that's how I would say it. So it's a mouthful. What is salvation? Salvation is simply you believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the son of God, he died on the cross for your sins in your place, paid the penalty for your sins and was raised up from the dead. You believe in that, Jesus? You are saved, baby, forever. Okay? Now, not CRT. Now, this is a mouthful. <laughs> There's no way to reduce this. You become woke to personal and national racism. Your own personal racism and the racism of this country. This is your born-again moment. This is your, to use communistic terms, your raised consciousness moment. Okay? And they do use that language even now in, in woke um, literature. Which means that you have a conviction. Being woke means you have a conviction of your racism and your privilege and you lament it. Like you mourn and you grieve over it. You're like, well, if I am racist, shouldn't I? You got to go back to what our definition of racism is. We've spent three months exploring these things. Racism and privilege. After you have, whoa, I don't want to lose that. After you have become woke and you lament and you conf uh, then you confess and you renounce that racism and privilege to BIPOCs, okay? You begin, you, you begin to find BIPOCs and you build relationships with them, which usually is how you become woke in the first place. The first step actually before that is, is to build relationships so that you can zip it and listen to the stories of people who uh, who are on the margins of society. Then you listen to their stories and you're convicted and you become woke. And then to them, you confess and renounce your own racism, the nation's racism, the privilege that this society has given you. Then you become an activist to do the work of disrupting oppressive structures, 
oppressive systems, knowledges, and privilege. You go out and you evangelize others of your own kind and group. You shame them who are blind to their racism and privilege. You call on them to confess and repent, all while helping center marginalized voices. You do the work. You do the work. Remember what I said? Anybody who says CRT in a church is just an analytical tool to try and understand okay, how oppression or racism or conflict uh, or, or disparities exist in society is either grossly ignorant or they're lying to you. There's no middle ground here. They are either supremely ignorant on what CRT teaches or they are masters at lying to you. Okay, that's it. There's no middle ground with that. Okay, what am I saying? If you, if you use CRT to analyze society, CRT necessarily requires you morally to get engaged and do the work of activism. If you, you, here's the thing. If you use CRT as your glasses to look at society, it will show you, if you look through those glasses, that there is oppression, that people are, 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 are victims. And then there are victimizers, okay? How can you morally sit back and not then become a part of the solution to dismantle those oppressive relationships in society? You would be more morally complicit to see it the way CRT sees it, but then not get involved with helping to break down those institutions that are racist and are oppressive. You would be more morally guilty that way. You'd have less guilt on you than the person who is not aware of it. The CRT uh, elites would say, you, it, it would be like being a Christian and being this grossly backslidden, worldly Corinthian type of Christian, but meanwhile saying, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, and you live nothing like a Christian should live. Like, excuse me, your identity and you seeing Jesus Christ should be moving you to live for Jesus Christ. There's a serious disconnect between seeing. Imagine if someone walked in here and they said, I, gee, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. And they live the grossest worldly lifestyle possible and without a single uh, uh, ounce of conviction that they should do otherwise. Does that raise a flag in anybody's mind? Certainly would mine. Like, whoa, brother or sister, if you even are, you know, I mean, we need to talk. That's the same thing in CRT. You can't actually look at the world and see it through the lens of CRT and then not do something when those lenses show you where there are problems in society. You have the moral obligation to become an activist and do the work. So that's why when someone says, well, I'm just using it as an analytical tool, you're, you're, you're Levi with the Skittles last week. That's what you are. Remember that illustration in the sermon? Okay, you're just following the breadcrumbs that, that they're laying out for you. And, and if you, especially if you're a leader, you have no business being in leadership if you, if you can't discern those issues. Woke social justice salvation is guilt-driven works-based acceptance into the woke community. It's guilt-driven, right? You're, 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 you're guilty for your racism and your privilege. What you will never be able to shed permanently, there's no like one-time permanent forgiveness for you being white. You're, you can't do anything about this. You can't do anything about you being a man, despite what they try and tell you today. <laughs> okay? Now, works-based, that's doing the work. As long as you're devoted, I'm telling if you want, you'll get, you'll, you'll, they will burn you to the ground if you're like, I'm one of you, but you don't do the work. They will burn you to the ground. Like in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways. Uh, it works, works based, yeah. Acceptance into the woke community. So you're accepted so long as you're doing the work and you're advocating. And that means, if, especially like if, if I were to become woke, on the intersectionality scale, because I'm white, I'm a man, I'm Christian, I'm cisgender, I'm heterosexual and all that stuff, I would be way, I would be at the very bottom, like they have a pole, right, and they have the top, which is like the black transgender woman, and the bottom is me, and it's not even far enough down, so they have to stomp it down further and say, you're down there, okay? So that's where you belong. What does that mean? It means the further down I am, the less I talk. I don't talk at all. I just listen to those who have authority to tell me what's real and what's true. Rather than salvation in the Bible is a free gift from God to anyone who accepts it. 
Anyone who accepts salvation in Jesus' name is fully forgiven of all their individual sins and they're justified before God. And they're justified by God himself. Okay? All, uh, or excuse me, a life of works follows that. Salvation first, then a life of works. The life of works is, is, is born after and born out of that salvation, right? That's what, that's the, the order in in Christianity, in the Bible. In CRT, salvation, a person is saved so long as they are devoted to anti-racist works. In biblical salvation, a person is saved when they put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. They are accepted by God. In uh, woke salvation, you are accepted by the woke community and approved by them. Identity. We're going to unpack all this a lot more. There's a lot of uh, scripture that we'll get into with all this. Okay, Identity. In the Bible, your identity is in Christ. Go to Ephesians. Go to Ephesians with me here. Actually, no, go to 2 Corinthians 5. Sorry, I have you bouncing around everywhere. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. This is my, this is my, my verse. After I was saved, this is like the first verse I read. I was like, oh. 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 17. Second Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Amen to that. Amen to that. Identity in CRT, however, is your social category. Which groups of oppressors do you belong to? Which groups of the oppressed do you belong to? Those are your identities. Those are your fundamental identity. Those are not secondary. Those are not, um, those are not uh, uh, subordinate to your identity in Christ. There's a whole, we're gonna, this, this, the in Christ identity, biblically, we're going to really unpack that um, in, this, uh, in this phase of our study in the weeks ahead and the social categories of oppressed and oppressor that you belong to, those are not subordinated to being in Christ. Okay? Being in Christ is subordinated to those. That's why uh, I'll read like uh, James Cohen, Black Liberation Theology, Godfather. He says things like, he says things like I'm black and I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm, I need a black Christianity. I need a black Jesus. Right? His blackness is uh, it subordinates who Jesus is. His black political ideology subordinates his identity in Christ, but he doesn't have an identity in Christ because he's a different Christ. Okay? The Great Commission, the purpose of the church, is to evangelize all nations with the gospel that saves men's souls and reconciles them to God so they're in a right relationship with God. And then the church's uh, responsibility is to disciple those who believe so that they begin to obey the teachings of Jesus Christ and live their lives for Jesus Christ with increasing uh, devotedness and glory to Jesus. That's, that, that's a mouthful. Evangelize and disciple. That's the purpose of the church. Not become woke, anti-racist, who do the work of activism to achieve social equity. That is CRT Christianity. You become woke, you become an anti-racist, you do the work of activism to achieve social equity. You can't find that anywhere in scripture. You can if you're mangling the scriptures and they mangle the scriptures. We'll see that unpacked more. Uh, eschatology, and then we're going to wrap it up. Never enough time, folks. You guys got to stop talking so much. <sighs> stop asking so many questions so I can just... Eschatology. The world will be increasingly evil till Jesus returns to earth in power and glory. The judgment of the nations will, be, uh, will occur. The establishment of his kingdom on the earth for a thousand years. The great white throne. Then the new heavens and the new earth. There will not be equity in the kingdom of God. There won't. There will be entrance into the kingdom by grace. Not by merit, but by grace. However, rewards, status, and so forth will be earned. Position, status, rewards, compensation, so forth, uh, 
when you stand before Jesus Christ, that will all be dependent on your faithfulness. You will earn it and merit it. It will depend on your faithfulness to Christ in this life as a Christian. Remember when I said you're saved and then you live a life of works? That's the order? That your, work, your, your devoted life of good works is born out of your salvation after your salvation? Well, that whole life of faithfulness to, to doing good for the cause of Jesus Christ is what Jesus is going to judge and then reward you on based on that level of faithfulness. Not CRT eschatology, which is progressively moving society towards a social justice style kingdom of God. And they do use that. Jim Wallace, uh, uh, Walter Rauschenbusch, is that how you say his name? Um, uh, you know, all these guys, they use the phrase kingdom of God and it's a social justice style where they move society towards social justice style kingdom of God through activism and revolution where the oppressed and marginalized are liberated from oppressive power structures and from systems of privilege and ultimately attaining a communist-like equity among all groups. That is the CRT, progressive Christian um, uh, eschatology. That's what they're aiming towards. Just remove all the Bible language. It's just straight up communism. It's straight up Marxism. They'll talk about, oh, it's neo-Marxism, this, well, Marx, classical Marxism was, you know, the, 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 the proletariat and the bourgeois, you know, and it's like, it's like there was the struggle of class and there would be a revolution. This is neo-Marxism where it's slower and it's longer and, you know, you infiltrate systems and whatever. The point is the same. You're eliminating all disparity. You're bringing perfect equity into society. The utopia. It's the same thing. It all ends in the same place. It's es the eschatology is the same for CRT, for critical theory, for postmodernism, for uh, Marxism, for, uh, for the Frankfurt School, uh, for black liberation theology, for, for um, South American liberation theology, for intersection. It all is the same. Social justice, kingdom of God style is communist utopia. That's what it is, okay? You can, you can still advocate for the exact same thing if you take the, the Christian language that is used for dressing off from it, okay? So we're gonna go through each one of these in more detail uh, in the weeks ahead. I feel like there's just so much to get to uh, in, in each one of these, but I wanna unpack the biblical verses so much more on each one of these so that we can see them uh, and, and, and then have them compared, okay? I would ask uh, if there's any questions, but I'm already two minutes over because you guys talked way too much during the class. But if you do have questions, um, by all means, catch me after church or uh, shoot me an email this week or, or call me, okay? Let me pray, and then uh, we'll, we got people coming and we'll have church. Father, our desire is to stand firm on your word. You have given us the faith, and it is the faith once for all entrusted to the saints. And we are to be shepherds. Uh, there will be wolves, and they must be dealt with. Uh, Lord, we know that there are ideas that come from the spirit of the age. We even read in, in, in 1 Timothy 4 that there are doctrines of demons that will come through human hypocritical liars. And so, God, we know that this war is not against flesh and blood alone, but that this ideological war also is against the powers and principalities, the rulers and the authorities of this dark world. And so, God, we pray for our minds to be wise, for our hearts to be pure, for us to walk before you in a way that is holy in your sight. And, God, that we are useful uh, in your hands uh, to serve your purposes and God to bring glory to your name. We want to be, uh, we want to be blameless on the day that we stand before Jesus Christ, O oh Lord, and we want uh, it to be a wonderful day and we want it to be a day that not only glorifies Jesus, but a day in which we can glory in him uh, without shame, without fear, without shrinking back. So God, may we walk in faith, uh, Lord, and may we see uh, this day uh, is given to you fully from our hearts. In Jesus we pray. Amen.